Okay. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, so that's way more of an introduction than I yeah. myself. <laughs> Um, and thank you everyone for attending as we talk about two studies we've done using CSA data, uh, both to look at aspects of gender and health. Um, so uh, just to make sure that everybody knows a little bit about the CSLA, C, sorry, CLSA data set, um, there are approximately 30,000 Canadians age 45 to 85 in the data set, uh, and we use the whole data set. And um, both the studies that I'm going to talk about, well, the study I'm going to talk about, and then subsequently Afshin will talk about the second one, had findings that we thought were quite unexpected, and that only became apparent using methods beyond regression analyses. And so there will be some opportunity to discuss methods to uncover such information. Now, when I look at data, one of the questions I always ask of the data is, are there differences between men and women? Because that's what I do. I study uh, gen sex and gender and health. And if so, why are the differences? And what might explain those differences? And, and particularly, are they artifactual or are they real? Um, so one of the gender paradoxes of population health data is that women tend to report poorer subjective health than do men, but in every country of the world, women outlive men. And now using survey data, one can look for interactions with sex in the relationship with self-rated health, for example. But what we can't do with CLSA data or with any data set that I've uh, ever seen is to determine whether women and men considered different aspects of life when they actually were rating their health. So these different aspects might include things such as relative health. Uh, do respondents compare themselves to others of the same age? Um, or do they compare themselves to themselves at an earlier age or to expectations they might have for their age? And what aspects of life and health are they considering when they make their rating, their subjective rating of health? So do they consider mental health or just physical health? Do they consider chronic illness or only life-threatening diagnoses? Um, do they consider general well-being or life satisfaction versus specifically thinking about, for example, physical function and so on? None of the large data sets that I'm familiar with ask these questions. So I would, Susan is me, this is my hypothesis. I would hypothesize that some of the paradox of women's poor health, uh, poor self-rated health, sorry, and greater longevity is actually artifactual. And it arises from men's and women's different considerations when they're actually ranking their health. Uh, this has been suggested by qualitative research uh, and some small studies, but needs further study using large and representative uh, data sets and not samples of convenience, as was the case with the qualitative studies that looked at this. Uh, now, you might be beginning to, understand, to wonder why I'm going on and on about this. And it's because unlike almost all surveys that I'm familiar with or that are reported in the literature, the CLSA seems to demonstrate that women rank their health higher than do men. And so I wondered, or we wondered, what's this about? And is it artifactual or is it real? And uh, this is the study that I'm gonna talk about has been published. This is a screenshot of the publication and it's in the public domain, it's open access. So if you want to read more, just download it. Um, let me talk first about the background to the study and the objectives. So we know that self-rated health uh, is why a widely validated measure of general health. And the question is always asked the same way on all surveys. How would you rate your health? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. And these ratings are often collapsed into a, a good and a poor rating, though the 
the categories that co get collapsed into good or poor will vary depending on the data set. Um, so, like I said, we know that self-rated health is widely validated and a, a very good measure of general health. Um, but we don't, although the ratings, how the ratings are formed seems to be dependent on a whole variety of individual and also social factors. Men are thought to focus more specifically on physical well-being, and women uh, seem to take a broader view and consider mental health, well-being, and levels of physical activity and function. And again, I'm not talking about CLSA here, I'm talking about the literature. With the aging, any effects arising from inequalities in social circumstances seem to decline, while the impact of contextual fact factors like uh, culture or geography where one lives become more prominent in rating of one's health. So we wanted to consider a nuanced understanding of how complex coexisting interconnections amongst sex, and social locations or circumstances intersect uh, to shape subjective health. And I've introduced the term intersec intersection here. We are not going to talk theoretically about intersectionality, but that is certainly a principle or concept behind the work that both of us will present. Um, so the aim of our study was to understand what individual and social factors shape subjective health and whether such clusters uh, or sorry, whether clusters of these might better explain self-rated health of men and women. In other words, we wanted to model statistically the reality that ca the categories of men or of women are heterogeneous and that not all women are the same. So not everyone in the category women is the same. Using multi-level modeling, we were able to quantify and differentiate uh, between category variations, but also these within category heterogeneities. So we chose multi-level modeling to account for the nesting or clustering of individuals within social strata defined by, for example, levels of wealth or of education. Those sharing a cluster likely share certain characteristics uh, that shape values and behaviors. And this commonality is important to think about because it actually violates the assumption that each participant in a study is independent of all others. And that's an assumption that's central to regression analyses. Uh, so first, we first identified all characteristics that alone were significantly associated with self-rated health. And the four listed on the screen are what we found, uh, sex, education, wealth, and rural urban sta uh, status. And then we did bivariate analysis analyses and found that women were 7% less likely to report poor self-rated health. Remember, this is the reverse of what the literature suggests. But when we adjusted for education, wealth, rural, urban state status, so the, the characteristics that alone were significantly associated with self-rated health, when we did that adjustment, women then appeared to be 43% less likely to report poor self-rated health. So that's quite a big difference between men and women. Um, and this relationship between sex and self-rated health seemed therefore to be strongly intertwined with social factors. However, Poisson regression only allowed us to control for these social factors. And we really wanted to examine them to better understand sex differences in self-rated health. Um, I, I should also note that we introduced interaction terms uh, between sex and any of education, wealth, and urban or rural residents and none was significant. Um, just to give you a quick view of some of the other uh, aspects of the descriptive analyses. So characteristics that align significantly with reports of poor health for both men and women were having more chronic conditions, lower social participation, lower wealth, poorer nutrition, 
depression, impaired hearing, and weaker grip strength. And grip strength, uh, for those of you who don't, don't know, is quite a good indicator of physical function. Um, somewhat unexpectedly, actually, in both groups, in both amongst men and women, drinkers rated their, this is alcohol, drink, rated their health as better than did non-drinkers. Uh, and middle levels of income were associated with better self-rated health than were high income levels. And high income levels are greater than 150,000 per year. And that was household, household income. Uh, there were a number of sex or gender differences in associations that also emerged. And uh, you can see them on this slide and uh, I'll just let you read them. But in, but in summary, so after adjusting for the key confounders, um, in other words, after removing their impact, sex appears to explain 43% of the variability in poor self-rated health. But as I hinted at before, if one wants to study gender, uh, and that's the social opportunities constraints uh, associated with being a woman or a man in a given society. So if one wants to study gender, then the effects of social circumstances should not be removed. And so to consider, uh, yeah, sorry, just made sure I'm on the right slide here. Uh, so to consider gender, we then did multi-level analyses. And this is a summary of what we found. So the proportion of variability overall in self-rated health was explained um, by the following. So wealth clusters alone explained 21% of the variability. Education clusters alone explained 5%. Sex had very little explanatory value, 0.12%, and similarly rural urban residents at 0.2%. And we then combined some of these clusters to make more clusters. Um, and when we combined education and wealth, uh, the effect went to 15%. So remember wealth alone explained 21%, education alone explained 5%. The intersection of the two as, as cluster, in, cluster, in terms of cluster effects, was lower than the 26% that would have come from adding those two effects together. Uh, sex and wealth, and we're, we're particularly interested in, in uh, sex and wealth and sex in general. Um, so, because this is how we get to gender. So sex and wealth together explain 15%. But remember, again, that wealth alone explained 21%. So this dropped, this lowered the cluster effect of wealth alone when sex was included as an aspect of the clustering. And we also did three-way combinations. And with the three locations combined that had the strongest cluster effect were sex, wealth, and uh, rural urban status. So um, I've carefully not gone into great depth on the methodology, partly because options, the methodologist, not me. Um, but I, I want to say a bit about what the meanings of these findings might be. Um, so clusters defined by sex and wealth explain less variability than did wealth alone. And as I said, the effect dropped from 21% of the variability for wealth to 15%. And we interpreted this as evidence of a complex intersection of the two characteristics, that sex and wealth, uh, that was not additive. And remember that interactions are in a sense, a measure of an additive effect. Uh, and none of the intersections, uh, sorry, none of the interactions that we examined were significant. Um, so we can say that sex somehow mutes the impact of wealth on health, but we don't know why. Uh, so I wanna go back to the paradox that I started with. 
um, that women seem to rate their health more poorly than do men, but live longer than men. Um, and perhaps it is an artifact of failing to consider intersections and within group heterogeneity when studying the relationship between sex and self-rated health. Um, and to me, this means it's important to consider gender as well as sex, and that not all women are the same and not all women are different from all men. So one method for studying within group variability is what we use multi-level analysis, analysis. And this is certainly not the only level, uh, uh, sorry, the, not the only method that can be used to get at either intersectionality or within group variability. It's what we chose to use. And finally, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning and ask again whether some of the paradox might arise actually from sex differences in the factors men and women consider when they're rating their health. Uh, so correcting for the failure to consider interactions, intersections, or within group heterogeneity is a matter of research methodology. And those with greater research skill than have I could do, make this correction. But understanding differences in what participants actually consider when rating their health requires collecting more data. And so I raised the question for the CLSA of whether they might consider this and in, in future rounds of data collection, ask participants what they thought about when they were making their ratings of subjective health. Um, so the, I want to acknowledge the CLSA, of course, for the data, Queen's University, the CIHR who funded uh, the research of which this is a part, um, and FutureGen, which is the network it's a European Union and Canadian connection uh, that the CIHR funding came through. Uh, it was Gender Net Plus, actually. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, Janelle Yu, who is a student of mine who worked on, on this project. Um, so, Afshin, I will stop sharing. I think I will stop sharing. Wait a second. And then you can share, okay. Okay, hi. Uh, okay, thank you, Susan, for the presentation. Actually, you made my job a little uh, harder to explain uh, what else we found. Uh, actually, what we found for the, this is the second study that, uh, this is the paper which is under review currently. So almost one month, which is not a good, bad sign. So it means people are reading that paper. In fact, uh, we are uh, by the same kind of, thinking, intersectionality thinking, we looked at another outcome, which is home care access. And obviously the data we use is the same data that has been already introduced and most of you already know about it. Uh, some of you might ask, okay, what's the relationship to study one? First of all, the main uh, focus of study number two that, that I'm talking about was not looking at gender. So we wanted to identify patterns that kind of, uh, or predictors of home care receiving among Canadian population. But we used the same, uh, we had the same idea and we kind of conceptualized it. Okay, so this is something intersectionality going on. And that's why we put this together uh, and you will see why it kind of gets connected to the idea of gender. A little bit of the background. So we all know that uh, we are dealing with aging population, not in Canada, all over the world. And obviously we need more care, that's obvious. And we also know the pattern of the care is not just so simple. It doesn't mean that you, know, you get 
a disease, you get some kind of health condition and go to doctors, nurses and get care. It's some kind of interplay or interrelationship between a lot of characteristics or factors, individual, contextual, and maybe social network. And the good thing is we have a lot of models. A lot of models care people has been developed that kind of describes this pattern. And those models usually identify three kind of groups of factors. Let's call it factors for now. The first thing is why people actually need care. So why people start seeking care. So I'm talking about receiving care in general. Doesn't matter formal, informal, hospital, or home care. The first thing is reason, reason for seeking care. So feeling that you are not well. The second thing is predisposing factors or characteristics, somehow risk factors. So age, maybe sex, maybe socioeconomic status, something that kind of is a risk factor for disease, and then you will go for to be in the need of the care. And at the same time, there are some kind of enabling, which I call it circumstances, something at a structural and contextual level. So access to care or healthcare system. So models are very good to when they explain these patterns. But in fact, they are not so much useful for prediction. One reason is these models are general. The prediction difference, for example, in here compared to United States. And then we thought, OK, so maybe we need somehow a new data analysis using uh, CLSA to identify the predictors of the pattern, predictors of home care. That was the somehow objective of the study number, the second study. And we tried to do it, now. actually not tried, we did it separately for informal and formal home care use. So the idea is identify who is at high kind of propensity for getting, receiving home care. That was the idea we wanted. And this is the question we used. So we looked at uh, uh, this question from CLSA, which actually asked simply during the yeah, last year, did you receive any professional assistance, things like ADL and also IADL, and also managing care, household, housework, and other things? That this was the definition of formal care. Exactly the same question asked, but instead of asking from professional doctors, nurses, physical therapists, it was if a family member, a friend, or a neighbor helped you. And that was what we kind of uh, defined as informal care. That was actually the outcome measure. As I said, we were looking for predictors. And these are, it's not an exhaustive list, there are other things, but actually, so we think about socio-demographic, things like income, education, sex, obviously, uh, and also family-related living arrangement, how many generations generation live in, in a household, marital status, and some of, again, obviously, physical and mental care, uh, mental health factors, you know, ADL, self-perception of mental and also physical uh, health, chronic condition, and some contextual factor that we kind of got from CLSA. It's some kind of indices um, of material and social deprivation. So we put everything, all of these things, in a, some kind of uh, a statistical procedure, with, which is called recursive partitioning model. So very simply, this model is that this kind of statistical analysis is different from regression. So this, I mean, the regular regression that we are usually doing. What it does, it kind of separates subgroups with higher risk until identify the highest risk groups, not just one group. And it's able, this method is some kind of part of the machine learning procedures, kind of identifies or quantifies relationship between a lot, uh, a lot of um, variables. So we know in regression, you cannot fit so many variables, but with this method, you can. And output is very, very easy to see and look, it's pretty fun. And it's like a tree exactly. But something that is important, you identify high risk group. At the same time, it kicks out unimportant factors, which is so important because sometimes you think, okay, this factor is important for prediction. And it says, no, it's not. And obviously it's some kind of accelerator. So there is no causation. It's some only and only because just gives you the subgroups. It's totally accelerated. And we did it for the outcome of formal care received at home. Before getting there, let me just show you what descriptive we found. So obviously, we all are familiar with CLSA data. We have a high functioning population, mostly because it's in Canada and also because they are not that old anyhow, and high level of education. What we found is 
for both formal and informal care, women kind of receive more, which is again, it's no surprising. So as we know, women access care or use care more frequently. So, so far, not, nothing surprising up to this point. But when we generated the regression tree model, there are a lot of information there. Uh, obviously, we don't want to go there. S one thing that we totally, totally expected that sex would be somewhere there. So maybe not the first one. The first one is ADL, obviously, the kind of physical uh, functioning problems. But we would expect, OK, sex should be somewhere there. But it was not. So I did a lot of, you know, kind of uh, modification and tuning and everything with the mother, but you know, sex was not really there. We expected sex be somewhere there. As I said, we did not focus on sex. We just wanted to identify different kind of factors and see which group is high risk, more or at more risk or higher risk. And we expected sex would be 100% there, but it didn't happen. So it was very kind of unexpected results that we found in this, in the second analysis, actually in the second study. So, and let's just focus on one part of this model or regression tree C because it's much easier to look at it there. As I said, sex is not there, but what was there? ADL was there, marital status was there. It was one of the important thing that kind of people access formal care and also age, obviously. Age is a factor there. But the main thing is, again, we don't wanna, talk about that part of it in the paper. We did talk about everything, but for this uh, uh, presentation, we wanted to see what happened to sex. Anyhow, it was not there. When we did the same procedure, we actually repeat the same analysis for informal care. In this time, sex was a predictor, but not so much important. So it's, you know, the model is a little bit, is not more complex, it's a little bit larger because informal care is a little bit more kind of, uh, more complex behavior. Asking, it needs some kind of social network. It's a little more complex compared to formal care. But anyhow, we got a little larger model, but it's interpretation is not that hard. You have just to focus part of the tree and say, okay, this part of the tree, I just wanna explore. Anyhow, sex was a predictor, but not so much not so important. You can see sometimes you see sex there. We would expect to see sex right here or even there. So, but we did not. But anyhow, at least sex was somewhere there. And also here, it was one of the predictors, but not an important one. I would still say this is some unexpected finding. And we really try to make same sense of this data. So, because we all know the data is good, CLSA is a very robust database and it's representative, it's valid, it's really good uh, kind of database. And this method that we use, it's an exploratory method, but for identification of most important factor, it's very powerful. So maybe it doesn't give you any, some kind of etiological information, but at least for finding subgroups, this is, the way to go, but it was not there. So let's try to make sense of the finding. So what's happening there? When sex was not a predictor of formal care, what that means, it means men versus women, they have equitable access to care, formal care. So in fact, it's a good thing. So in fact, it's, a risk, it's not a risk factor. It's not something that separates men and women. So it's equity across sex groups. And we also, as I said, we also find the same thing for other socioeconomic status, like immigration status and lower socioeconomic status, less education and uh, less income. But anyhow, so what we found is some equity. So everything, most of the thing that you identify in formal care model was about really diseases, but not for uh, social factors. Okay, so that's something we found, but why? We actually really don't know. The, is it because of universal Medicare system that we have, especially for older adults, that some kind of equalize gender inequality? Because we do have a universal healthcare system, it 
doesn't matter you are a woman or you are a man. So you will get the care that you need. So we know this system works for a lot, a lot of medical things. So we know for access to hospital, this system is good. So it's some kind of provide equity, but is it the same thing for formal care at home and informal care at home? We don't know, but maybe. At least what we observe is there is no inequity there. Or maybe as already Susan mentioned, maybe there is something that, that we really miss. Maybe there is some factors that we have to measure, but we don't. What exactly are those measures? I really don't know, but there is something related to being a woman versus being a man. So in the previous study, we thought, okay, so how women and men really perceive their health. So when you ask the same question, a man versus a woman, how they think may be differently. The same thing here, how women versus men in accessing to care behave differently. So maybe that's something that we should measure somehow, but we don't. When you don't measure, okay, you cannot really see it. And the other thing is maybe there are some kind of hidden intersections. For the formal care, we were able to kind of tease out or kind of find hidden intersections. For this reason, when we included all of those intersections that worked for formal care, behavior, sex just disappeared. Why? Because you know it was not because of the sex, it was, was because something that we kind of measured by sex. When we include all of them, sex went away. And we were able to really, really tease out intersection. But for formal care, not yet. Maybe if we had more measures, more kind of in factors that created those intersection, we could see the same thing for informal care. So, and what we observe in for informal care, it was actually because it was a function of that those hidden intersections that we kind of measured these guys in sex, being women versus men. So, in fact, uh, this was some kind of unexpected finding that we found and we tried to make sense of it. I'm not sure we 100% were able to do it. Two things that we kind of thought it can explain because the outcome was care is Medicare system, actually universal care system in Canada, or these intersections that are there. Uh, I, I'm totally, totally open to your comment, to your question, and let's see if we can make a better sense of this finding. Uh, at the end, I have to acknowledge uh, almost the same uh, kind of institution that Susan already said, but you know, I just want to put the name of the co-author team. Obviously, uh, Dr. Susan Phillips was the main author in this paper, and these are the co-authors that helped me a lot uh, in kind of conceptualization of this paper, especially because, you know, the care by itself is not my speciality as a health outcome, and also the help, they help in kind of writing the paper and other things. And if you want to contact me, this is my email address. And now I will stop and would be more than happy to answer any question you should have. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I do have a barking dog in my background. Um, there's some people in my backyard right now. So uh, just forewarning. Um, just a reminder, if you can post your questions in the Q&A box, uh, we're trying to get uh, questions focused in that section instead of the chat box, if possible, um, but I am monitoring um, both both places. Um, so the first question, there's um, a question for Susan, and that is how could participate, how could the participation rate in the CLSA, um, which there's um, uh, uh, Dr. Reyna's 2019 IJE papers quoted here as having a 45% overall response was about was that participation rate in the CLSA was about 45% with an overall response rate of 10%. So that was um, quoted. How can how can the participation rate in the CLA CLSA produce a non-random sample that could influence your findings, such as women reporting higher SRH? Did the participation participation rate differ by age? Um, and then the second question is: Were the sample weights incorporated into the analysis? So um, that's a big question from uh, Andrew Patterson. And if you wanted to also look at the question, Susan, that's uh, within the Q&A box. Okay, 
Thanks. So I also apologize. I have a potential barking dog. I had to move from one place <laughs> to another here. And uh, there's a bit of background noise, so I'm sorry. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, first of all, the question about the weights. I don't think we adjusted for the weight, the weighting. Um, the question about uh, representational, how representative is the CLSA. So I suppose one could look at the Canadian population age 45 to 85 and uh, compare um, indicators within the CLSA with, with the overall population to get a, an idea of re the representative nature. Uh, we did not do that. I think that this is a problem with absolutely any research that's done that it one will never have a truly representative sample. And one sort of hopes that the sample is not terribly unrepresentative um, and carries on from there. So all we can say with both the studies is in the CLSA sample, this is what was found. I hope that adequately answers the question. Okay. Great, thank you, and hopefully it did. And if not, if uh, there, if you want to post a follow up question, that's fine too. Um, there was a question in the chat that came um, from Monica Telly. Were there differences in formal healthcare usage in provinces that provide healthcare without cost versus provinces that use a sliding scale to determine fees for use of supports? Home care, sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, Home care, uh, not health care, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, no, I get the question. Uh, we didn't uh, consider province as a factor. Actually, we did not fit the province in the model. Yes, maybe, but we don't know. So the reason is uh, because uh, you all know uh, CLSA doesn't include all of the provinces. It does include good number of people, obviously, and it's a representative sample because of the weighting and sampling strategy. But uh, the question is a very nice, it's a very good question to work on it, but maybe if we want to answer the question, we need some kind of uh, more uh, census type of data that includes provinces, all provinces. We did not, uh, in, province was not part of the analysis strategy. Anyhow. So I have no answer for your question, which kind of maybe, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, well, sometimes we don't always have have the answers to all the questions, and, yeah. and that's okay. <laughs> um, um, another question is uh, Jennifer, for Jennifer. Can I just add to that? Of course. Also, yeah. if if one looks at the the proportion of the CLSA data set who actually accessed formal care, it was very small. I think it was one or two percent. So that to try to break that sample down further by province would have created cells that were just too small to make any kind of valid conclusions about. Okay, so the next question is for Afshin. Um, for informal care, I would say that the sex variable may be influenced by the social network quantity and quality of perceived support from each social tie, social tie and they could be important factors in predicting informal care. Was it possible to assess that using the CLSA data? Uh, we, uh, thank you, Tamara, for your question. Uh, actually, we uh, did not have all of the social network type of the question, how many friends do you have and how many times you are uh, seeing your uh, children and the other things. So yes, it can be, but again, as I said, it's we were at the mercy of the CLSA data. So when we talked about something that's unmeasured, that kind of generates intersection, maybe that's one of them. So because informal care, you are totally, totally right. Informal care is relates that accessible, having access to informal care, having friends, having neighbors, having family. So that was uh, not the thing that we totally uh, kind of included, but actually we include the number of house living arrangements. So living in the multi-generation kind of 
uh, multi-generation household, which was one of the factors for informal care. If you go back to the tree and look at it for informal care, it was somber, not one of the important ones, but it was there. But looking at social network, the way that we usually do in social network analysis, we did not have access to those data. It actually, the data was not there. Again, it can be part of the whole picture of uh, intersectionality that we miss and it's not there. So, do you want to add anything, Susan? No, that's, oh, okay. that's fine. I was, I was sitting thinking about um, what are the policy implications for this? And uh, so social connectedness probably is an important lo social location to consider because there are policies that could improve social connectedness, whereas considering something like um, immigration status. Uh, and I would, I would assume that first generation immigrants probably are more connected within their families and more likely to provide care to within the family. So provide informal care, but this is not something that can be changed by any kind of policy short of increasing immigration to change the population uh, demographics. So it, it's not a, it's an interesting thing to look at, but not a particularly useful thing to look at. Okay, great. Um, there was a question that came in in the chat, um, and that is, if marital status was a significant factor, then I'm wondering if the sex of the participants in couples mattered. One of you want to take uh, that uh, one on? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, uh, obviously. So, but um, uh, uh, 100%. But the thing is, uh, uh, marital status is a kind of measure of having a partner versus not having a partner. Mm -hmm. And sex is just a measure uh, of sex. Yes, it's, uh, it is. But in fact, uh, what we look at, it was intersection between these two. If the sex and marital status somehow intersect. First of all, I don't want to say the way that we analyze the data is the way to look at intersectionality. By no means, I want to say that. So there is no a standard or gold standard uh, quantitative way for quantification of intersectionality. But what we do, uh, but what we did, if the sex and marital status somehow intertwine and somehow interplay, to generate different rates or different risks for outcome. We should have seen marital status and sex, but we did not. We only saw marital status. So because marital status somehow is a measure indirectly of social networks. So when you are married, you have a stronger social network, probably. So, but sex was not there. For this uh, question, I would say we measure, I would consider marital status something differently from sex. Obviously, men and women consider marital status differently, again, in some kind of gender effect that was not really observed. I don't want to say it's not there, but it was not observed as far as I can interpret this kind of unexpected findings. Great. Um, so it's about the time in the presentation that or the webinar that people usually start to drop off. So we do have some more time and we will address the outstanding questions. But I did want to remind everyone, if you can please um, complete your survey on the before you leave or just after you leave, that would be a, that would be appreciated. Um, so we do have uh, one more question that needs to be addressed uh, for Dr. Phillips, and that's the tracking cohort. Uh, which is an additional 20,000 participants, uses telephone interviews across all 10 provinces and includes more rural participants. I realize that you use the comprehensive cohort, um, which is the in-person cohort. So I wonder if in the tracking cohort of the CLSA, if the results would be different, given that you use the rural urban variable in your clusters as well. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment <laughs> and interesting idea. and might move, move this study closer to generalizability than um, what we were able to get at with the comprehensive uh, set, data set. 
Afshin, do you want to add? Just wanted to say, uh, tracking cohort doesn't uh, or didn't have all of the information, all of the data that we wanted for this data analysis. Yes, it did have the province and other things that's uh, or rurality, but for uh, remember what you we just tested for a lot of predictors or uh, I, I know you're talking about the uh, first study, but we. Uh, tested for a lot of factors, a lot of variables, but you know those are the things that ended up important for us. So that was the reason we use comprehensive because we wanted to use more kind of variety of the data. But 100% when rurality was something important, tracking, uh, tracking uh, cohorts would be more important, more kind of useful. So I totally agree, but we did not use for that reason. Thank you. Okay. Um, and another quick question came in from Kathy Cora Fuller, I guess there is no way or no easy way to look at SRH versus more objective measures of health. Um, we actually have just accessed CLSA data to do some similar analyses, but looking at objective health. Uh, I'm very hesitant to call it objective health because Afshin and I were involved in another large research study using, it's the International Mobility and Aging Study. And what we saw from that was that objective health isn't always as objective as you might think it is, that women often underestimate their abilities and stop short of reaching their full ability if one is testing, for example, grip strength or standing up from a chair or the various measure, objective measures that are available. But we are going to try to look at uh, objective health and some of the parameters that we've already talked about here. Okay, um, another question is, uh, does the CLSA data indicate if participants have a regular physician or nurse practitioner? I'm actually trying to think of, think of that as well. I'm not sure. If other people who work with CLSA yeah. can help, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Actually, I uh, this is not a variable that I don't like mm -hmm. so much because it doesn't say anything. So you might have a mm -hmm. doctor, but you never go there. But yeah. that's why we never looked at it. But I'm not sure if there is a data. I'm sure that we didn't use that data. That's the thing, 100%. Even if there was that data, we didn't include it in any of these two analyses. But if it's there, actually, I don't know. If somebody can tell us, it would be helpful. Yeah, I actually, I, I should know this. Um, I know we do ask against health, we do ask about healthcare use, but whether we ask directly about a regular physician or nurse, nurse practitioner, I, I know we don't use that language. So um, I think it would depend on how the exact question is being um, answered. Uh, okay, I think probably this may be the last question, um, but if you do, we do have some more time, so please feel free to send in any additional questions. Um, oh, it's more of a statement, I think. We do have a CLSA-based paper regarding self-reported sensory problems versus behavioral measures of sensory impairment. So that was just a note from uh, Kathy Pecora Fuller. Okay. So I don't see any more questions. Um, so I will, I think, wrap it up. Um, and just, you know, first, firstly, by saying uh, thank you again to our presenters, we really appreciate your participation in uh, the CLSA webinar series. Um, it, it really helps to to demonstrate the uh, bring the data to life that uh, we are we're we've been collecting for the past 10 years, and we'll be doing so into the future as well. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that the deadline for the data access applications, is, the next deadline is January 12th of 2022. So please visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is um, available, um, including um, note that the COVID-19 questionnaire study data is available as well as details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the session today. Um, so for our upcoming webinar, uh, which will be entitled Exploring the Patterns and Impacts of Diet and Nutrition Among Older Adults in the CLSA, it will take place on November 25th at noon, 
and it will be presented by Dr. Jacqueline Hurley, um, as well as Dr. Rachel Murphy. Details and registration information will be posted on our CLSA website under webinars, um, if it's not posted already. Um, and remember that the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So thank you again to our presenters and for everyone who attended today's session.